everybody. My name is Matt. I'm the pastor here at United Church Online and in Gunnisonville in Bath, Michigan. I'm so glad you're here with us today. In fact, honestly, this is a perfect time for you to be here because we're beginning our fall all-church study of this book, actually. The book's called Unafraid, Living with Hope and Courage in Uncertain Times. We're going to take a look at this for the next five weeks here in worship and in small groups, and I want to encourage you to read the book along with us. We've got books for you free of charge. Um, if you'd like to get a hold of me, we would be glad to get you one so you can read along. You'll find information about the small groups in the program today and also online on our website. Next week, we're going to have some people being baptized and joining the church, so I want to welcome you to participate in that. Just contact me, and we'll talk about how that happens and how you can get involved in that. Today, we're going to have communion together. So I encourage you to get some bread, some juice, crackers and drinks, something to eat and drink so you can participate in that. And also grab a candle from around your house. Um, if you want to grab one, we always light a candle at the beginning of the service just to remind us that God is present and to pray for a moment. So if you'll grab that candle and um, get a match or a lighter, and we will light this together and say a prayer as we begin. God, we want to thank you, and we want to center our thoughts, be in this moment together. We know we've got ourselves physically here, we're listening, we're attentive, but we also just want to put everything else in our lives on the back burner, out of our minds, uh, what has been going on this morning, what we have yet to do today. We want to hone in just on this moment and really be present. So we do that. We take a breath. We welcome your presence here. We honor you with our presence, with our lives, with our praise, with our thanks for this life, for this place that you've created for us to be, not only with you, but with each other. When Jesus taught people to pray, he included this phrase, give us this day our daily bread. It starts with us. We pray not only for our own needs, for daily bread, but for those all around our planet, for those who are hungry, we pray that you would supply, that we might help supply the food for their needs. God, we've dedicated hundreds of dollars just this past month to weekend survival kits to help feed those kids. So we lift up now those children and those families who will receive those kits, and we pray for them. We pray not only for the, the food, but for the rest of the daily bread, for the nourishment that we need, knowledge, wisdom, spiritual knowledge. For God, you've said we don't live by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of God. So we pray for each other today that you would be for us that bread as we open our hearts and minds to you, that you would speak to every one of us. And now we broaden that and pray for those people who come to our minds that we feel might need a touch from you today. God, for those people who are hurting, recovering, spiritually wandering, in need, we pray specifically for the people that come to our mind right now. God, we're honored to be here. We've set this time aside. We don't want to miss a moment of what you have for us. So we give you our attention, hear our gratefulness, and speak to our hearts today. We dedicate our lives to you. We dedicate the financial gifts that we've given to this church to you this week. And we dedicate them to you, your church, and your service with grateful hearts. Thank you for the opportunity to gather today and be a part of this church. In Jesus' name, amen. So damn easy to say that life's so hard Everybody's got their share of battle scars As for me, I'd like to thank my lucky stars That I'm alive and well 
It'd be easy to add up all the pain And all the dreams you set and watch go up in flames Dwell on the wreckage as it smolders in the rain But not me, I'm alive And today you know that's good enough for me Breathing in and out's a blessing, can't you see? Today's the first day of the rest of my life And I'm alive and well Yeah, I'm alive Stars are dancing on the water here tonight It's good for the soul when there's not a soul in sight But This motor's caught its wind and brought me back to life Now I'm alive and well And you know today that's good Breathing in and out's a blessing, can't you see? Today's the first day of the rest of my life, and I'm alive and well. Yeah, I'm alive and well. We're already in the middle of the crop walk season. We have one more week to get our steps in, so there's still time for you to join the Bath or Gunnisonville team or to simply make a donation to this great mission. Most of us can go to the grocery store whenever we need food and don't have to worry about rain flooding our crops, bugs eating our gardens, or rivers running out of fish, but so many families around the world do have to think about this all the time. Over the past 19 months, these families have also been impacted by COVID-19, just as families here in the U.S. have been. Because of the pandemic, there are even more people in need of food and clean water around the world and even in our community. It's so important that we do whatever we can, and the money we raise can help in so many ways. I want to share some photos from our 2020 Crop Walk. We had a wonderful group of walkers last year, and between Bath and Gunnisonville, we raised $3,840 for crop. I've mentioned that the Crop Walk raises money for Church World Services, and this organization can stretch the funds we raise to do so much to help so many in need. Shirley Carolyn and I want to thank everyone who has already signed up to Rock or Walk and to those who have generously donated. 
Again, there's still time to join either the Bath or Gunnisonville team if you would like to walk or rock to help others struggling to get by. To join us, just go to unitedch.com, look for the crop walk sign, and click on a team link. You can also go to the church website if you would just like to donate to either an individual or to one of the church teams. Also, the addresses for both churches are on a link under crop walk information if you would like to mail a check rather than donate online. Fall is a beautiful time of year, so go alone, take your dog, gather your family, or get friends together for a stroll, and take advantage of this last opportunity to join us in the crop walk. Whether you walk, rock, or just donate, you will be doing a world of good. And don't forget to take a video of yourself walking or rocking and save it to the link posted on the church webpage. We'll compile them and share the video on the Sunday when we announce our grand total. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Good morning. I'm Catherine Reed from the Gunnisonville Church, and I will lead you in the Lord's Prayer this morning. Will you pray with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is Jen from the United Methodist Church in Bath. It is my honor to read the scripture for you today. Isaiah 41.10 Don't fear, because I am with you. Don't be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will surely help you. I will hold you with my righteous strong hand. Psalm 56, 3 through 4. Whenever I'm afraid, I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise. I trust in God. I won't be afraid. What can mere flesh do to me? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I wonder if any of you have heard of this poem that I've heard about this week called The Age of Anxiety. It's an epic poem that was written by W.H. Auden. That poem highlights the human condition, a condition magnified by the lack of tradition or religious belief in the modern age. Now, the setting is a nighttime bar in New York City where four strangers, three men and one woman, meet and they talk and they drink. And the carousing ends in the woman's apartment. Two men leave, and the third man disappoints the woman by passing out drunk. Now, it sounds pretty heavy and depressing, doesn't it? I bring that poem up because of the title. The title, The Age of Anxiety, and the date it was published, 1948. Wasn't the world simpler then? I mean, it seems like a poem with that title could be published today, but I guess if it was published today, it'd have to be titled The Age of High Anxiety, because things are crazy today, honestly. Foreign terrorism, domestic terrorism, collapsing buildings all over the place, insurrections, political polarization, loss of shared values, global warming, economic insecurity, inflation, job loss, trillions of dollars in deficits, school shootings, racist killings, global pandemics, politics, fake news, and an ever-increasing pace of change, along with the loss of traditions. Now, on top of that, something bad happens, and we know about it immediately, don't we? Some of us watch the evening news every day of the week, and don't you see this? Every day, breaking news, breaking news. Some people have their phones set 
to notify them of any breaking news. And it's happening all day. It's no wonder we're anxious people. One of the things that I get anxious about is Sunday morning worship. Now, I know that I'm more anxious than normal when I've had a nightmare that I show up in church. I've actually had this happen. I have this nightmare that I show up in church and I don't have anything prepared to say at all. In fact, occasionally, now this hasn't happened for a while, but occasionally I'll look down and I have forgotten to put my pants on. So there I am in my boxers with nothing to say. And there's this intense feeling of panic. Now, I'm glad that hasn't happened in a while, but I still have dreams pop up from time to time that make me know that I'm, I have some internal stress, right? Now, I think a lot of us, especially the men out there, would you agree that we wouldn't say we're afraid? No, we don't like to admit that. We don't like to say we're afraid. We would say, hey, I'm stressed because I've got so much going on. Well, here's what WebMD says about fear, stress, and anxiety. All three feelings are psychologically similar. So, for instance, you might feel tension in your body or your heart racing or high blood pressure or insomnia. With stress or fear, your symptoms will likely pass when that threat disappears or soon afterward. But anxiety, anxiety can last a lot longer because it's not directed or linked to any external causes. So when we're afraid and our anxious response comes up, it can unintentionally make our anxiety last even longer. Well, I want you to chat about this for a second. What about your life? What would you say in your world makes you anxious? Or what makes you highly anxious? Talk about that for a minute. Each week for the next five weeks in the series, we're going to look at a top fear that Americans have, what stresses us out the most based on some surveys. Then we're going to explore what the mental health community says about stress, fear, and anxiety, because each week I'm going to give you a mental health practice to combat fear. And we're going to end each week by exploring what guidance the Bible has to offer for fear in this age of high anxiety. There is a fascinating paradox here about what stresses us out, because it's true that ever since anxiety levels have been measured by social scientists, they keep going up, and ours today are off the charts. But here's the reality, the paradox is this, that we are living longer, that violent crime is down from the high in the mid-90s. Listen to this one. Less Americans have died in a war than in any other 40-year period in the history of our country. Poverty levels are actually going down worldwide, and the ability to read is going up. And yet, we are more anxious 
than ever before. You'd think based on how anxious we are as a society, even before the pandemic, that all of those things would be getting worse, but they're not. In Daniel Gardner's book called The Science of Fear, he puts it this way, we are the healthiest, wealthiest, and longest lived people in history, and we are increasingly afraid. This is one of the great paradoxes of our time. We're increasingly afraid, and that's a problem because it ties into our anxiety, and our anxiety wears us down emotionally, spiritually, physically. We can literally worry ourselves to death. Now, this is fascinating because there's biology behind all of this. Anxiety and worry are actually gifts from God. So I want to take a moment as we start to celebrate the good side of this and to be thankful for it. They're all part of a survival system that's built into our bodies and saves our lives. Worry is our early warning system, kind of like smoke detectors. Parts of the brain move resources away from other parts of the brain and towards our muscles. Anxiety and worry are what allow us to have superhuman strength, to run really fast or to be ready to fight or flight. So thank you, God, for that, right? That saved our lives and our ancestors' lives a lot. The problem, though, is that our early warning system was built for a much different environment than what we currently live in. The pace of change has accelerated, and we're struggling to adjust to that. And in the struggle to adjust, our early warning systems, like our smoke detectors, they're going off accidentally. When that sort of thing happens persistently in your body, you get a general anxiety disorder. There are 6.8 million adults right now suffering from general anxiety disorder in America. What happens is that the amygdala in our brain is sending warning signals when there really is nothing to actually be afraid of. I've learned recently that anxiety is a negative projection into the future. There can be some good projection into the future, right? It's a good thing to anticipate our needs and our threats for our future like a squirrel who stores up nuts for the winter. If the squirrel didn't do that, well, it'd die because it wouldn't be prepared. Now, it's good to know that someday we're gonna retire and that social security check probably won't cover all of our living expenses, so we better start saving now. It's a good thing to have some medicine in your cabinet for when you get the cold or flu. So we have to anticipate those things, right? Our anticipation system works alongside our imaginations. Now, I love our imaginations, but it can really get out of whack. This can happen when we constantly get bombarded with bad news. We look at all this stuff happening in our world through the magnifying glass of our imagination, and we make mountains out of molehills. The psychological word for this is over-catastrophize. Now, I've done this, probably you have too, when we're tempted to over-catastrophize, it can be helpful to remember the acronym for fear, false events appearing real. These are the things that we make up in our minds that go way beyond reality. And the problem is that our fight or flight response can't tell the difference. So our body ramps up time after time as if these false events are real. A simple example of this is when we want to tackle a tough conversation with somebody, right? We predict in our head how the other person's going to respond. We'll worry about it. We'll anticipate the worst. We'll be anxious about the conversation. As long as we're putting it off, we're more and more anxious. We're predicting in our heads how the other person will respond. And we often worry about this and anticipate the worst. We'll be anxious about the conversation that we're going to have in our head, and in actuality, that might not reflect the conversation at all. It's a false event, a false conversation that our body believes is real. There have certainly been a lot of opportunities for false events to appear real through this whole pandemic, and I'm sure we're going to have more of that in our lives. Talk for a minute, will you? Chat about this question. When have you experienced fear 
being a false event appearing real. So how do we combat our fears? Well, let's look at mental health professionals. They have a process, a technique called exposure therapy. This is a great therapy. It might be one of the therapies that you get help from in this series. It's a really good one to use. Exposure therapy is about slowly exposing yourself more and more to the things that you fear or that cause you deep anxiety. And to do that, with appropriate supports in place. Fear doesn't disappear through avoidance. That's important to get. Fear does not dissipate, does not disappear by avoiding it. It only goes away by facing it. So slowly being exposed over time to the thing you fear causes you not to fear it so much anymore. The anxiety loses its grip on you. Avoidance is not a fear strategy. I don't think avoidance is a faith strategy either. I love how exposure therapy fits with faith. They really go together. And I invite you to live by faith, not fear. So let me be clear. Faith is not an avoidance or denial of the things that cause you fear. That's only going to increase your fear. But faith and exposure therapy work together to encourage you to lean into the things that cause you anxiety and fear. And you do the leaning with the help of God and with trusted friends or professionals. I came across a great example of exposure therapy, confronting your fears. It's a story about Bob Carlson and his daughter, Tess. Tess is 10 years old, and she was terrified of heights. She was terrified of going fast, of going upside down, and the worst thing she could imagine was a roller coaster. So Bob, her dad, had the idea and talked to her about confronting her fears. He said, I know you're really scared about roller coasters. How about, would you trust me, take my hand, and we're going to go on a tiny little roller coaster. So they went to Six Flags, and they rode just a, the tiniest kid's roller coaster. And she did okay, right? So he said, would you be able to trust me and go just one a little bigger? So they went on just one a little bit bigger. And he asked, how about another one? Well, she had to think about that for a while. But she went on one more, and she survived that. And they did that process until they finally got to the nine story tall Revolution roller coaster. This is one where you wear 3D goggles on your face, where you're going upside down on two different loops, traveling about 60 miles an hour. And he said, Are you okay? Are you gonna trust me on this? And she did. And he recorded the audio of her on the roller coaster. Take a listen.
just happened, Tess? I just rode a looping roller coaster for the first time in my life, and it was so exciting and wasn't even that bad. I am a different person than I was a minute ago. Don't you love that? I'm a different person than I was a couple of minutes ago. Now, how did she become that different person? She became that person because she faced her fears. This brings us to the faith side of confronting fear. For thousands of years, people didn't have therapists to go to. They didn't have medicines that we take now. They didn't know about exposure therapy. So they used the tools available. And those tools included turning to God and the Bible for guidance. That's why you'll see over 400 verses in the Bible that address fear. And the common theme of those verses is summed up in this one statement. Will you say it with me? Do not be afraid. A great example of that statement is in Isaiah 41.10. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. One of the ways we calm our fears and live by faith is to pray verses like these. So you might read that and then pray, God, help me. Help me not to be afraid. Remind me that you're with me. God, I give you my fear, my discouragement. Strengthen me. Help me. Hold me. Give me victory over this fear. That's a great way to use those verses in the Bible. Now, that was from the prophet Isaiah, but consider King David as well. King David was the greatest king of Israel, but a turbulent beginning he had with his predecessor, King Saul. You see, David was more and more successful on the battlefield, and he got more and more popular, and Saul, the king before him, wanted to kill him. And he had everybody looking for him to fight his fear and stress and anxiety while he's hiding out in a cave. This is what David does. He sings to God his poems. He sang them over and over. There's a whole book right in the middle of our Bible that has all of these poems and songs in them. It's called Psalms, which means praises. It's like having an MP3 player right in the middle of your Bible. Now, some of these psalms are written for when times are really good, and other psalms are written for when times are really bad. Psalm 56 opens up with this editorial note. For the choir director, a psalm of David regarding the time the Philistines seized him in Gath to be sung to the tune of Dove on Distant Oaks. David's poem jumps right into how bad things are. Oh God, have mercy on me, for people are hounding me. My foes attack me all day long. I am constantly hounded by those who slander me, and many are boldly attacking me. But then comes the but. And there are so many of these in these poems in the Psalms. David says, but when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. I will praise God for what he has promised. I will trust in God. So why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? Now, we don't know the tune Dove on Distant Oaks, but we do know that David sang these songs of prayer again and again, as did the people of Israel. There's a way that singing speaks to our fear and reminds us of truth. So let me illustrate this. You, have you heard this thing called a thunder shirt? We've used this on our dog Jada before. You've heard me talk about Jada. Jada's getting kind of old and grumpy, but boy, when there's a dog walking around outside, I mean, Jada just, Jada wants to get out and show that dog who's boss really badly, just growling and acting really tough. But you know what really freaks Jada out? Thunder. Thunder or fireworks? My gosh, on the 4th of July, her whole body shakes when she hears these things. Her anxiety raises. She hangs her head. She starts roaming around the house, not sure where to go. She's knocking things over. 
So we got this Thunder shirt, and it's essentially a compression shirt for a dog. And the compression shirt calms the dog down and keeps them from feeling anxiety. It's, it's kind of like they're being continually held by their owner. Now, here's the point. Singing can be like a thunder shirt for us when we're afraid. I've experienced this before personally. My grandfather was in the hospital. He had been suffering for some time with cancer, and he was in his last days. His body was stressed. He was tense. And when I went to see him, we talked to him. He couldn't respond because of the tubes. We weren't sure exactly how much of it he was hearing or comprehending. Well, we prayed. We prayed out loud. We prayed with him. We read scripture to him. And occasionally, he'd show some positive reaction. And then I thought, how about if I sing a song? So I started singing a hymn. I started singing Amazing Grace in his, his hospital room. And as I sang, you could just see his body relax. I sang all the verses I could remember, and then uh, a few more songs. I, I kept trying to think of more hymns that I knew. And the more that I sang, the more he actually calmed. And after a while, he actually sat up, put his hand behind his head, which he, he just loved to sit like that most of the time with his arms up behind his head. He put his hands behind his head, and he kind of tipped his head up. You could see a whole different presence in his body. The fear was gone. The tension was gone. I was just amazed. Here's what happens. Singing reminds us that God is holding us through the thunder of our fear. When we sing, we're reminded of God's truth, and we engage our imagination away from the worst case, over-catastrophizing, and instead of pointing our imagination toward the worst, we point our imagination toward God and the truth that He is with us. So I want to encourage you to keep singing when you're fearful or when you're anxious. So let's remember where we've been today. Fear is false events appearing real. Don't give in to fear. We're always going to have fear around us. But here's what we do with it. We face our fears. We lean into them. And when you do find yourself afraid, consider singing or praying the Psalms. What stresses you? What causes you anxiety? What makes you afraid right now? I want to invite you to say or sing this song out loud today. This is a recording of David Hunt that was used at Billy Gladstone's memorial service. The song is How Great Thou Art. Let it redirect your imagination away from fear and to God's faithfulness. Oh Lord my God, when I I hear the rolling thunder, your power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. who agreed said amen. Hey, we're going to celebrate communion now, and I encourage you to do that with us. If the antidote to fear is faith, then this is a great place and time to remember and receive that gift of courage and life. Everyone is welcome to participate in communion in the United Methodist Church. You don't have to be a member of our church or of any particular church. If you love God, love your neighbor, um, want to follow in Christ's footsteps, and we, we encourage you to take communion with us today. So 
Will you pray with me? God, you made us. We pray that you would direct our paths, that you would use every situation to bring us back to you, that we would have the bread of life today in this communion that we need to have the life you want us to have. We want to cooperate with your spirit and open ourselves up to your work in us. God, I pray you'd pour out your spirit upon us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. There is no magic in this simple, ordinary bread and juice that we have today. The power is in what God has done for us and what happens as you surrender your life to God. So come to receive forgiveness and the power to face your fears with courage and hope. The body of Christ, broken for you, an example of courage. Take it and eat it together. The blood of Christ shed to forgive all that comes between you and God and to live with hope. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. It's been great to be with you today. I'm excited to begin this journey of our annual fall all church series with you. And I'm praying that in a very real and profound way, you will find yourself living with less fear and more hope and courage over the next five weeks. Let us know on the connect card what group you'd like to try out and if you need a book. Enjoy your small group this week. See you soon.